good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, sorry, excuse me. Um, uh, this is Curtis Linton and David Smith. David is the Elementary Math Curriculum Specialist with the Utah State Office of Education. Um, you are not seeing our image yet, but uh, let me let me work on pulling it up. But while I'm pulling this up, David, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? All right. Um, well, I'm, I'm, as Curtis said, I'm Elementary Mathematics Specialist at the State Office of Education in Utah. Um, I really love my job. I've spent 35 years in education as an elementary teacher, middle school teacher, principal, um, assessment specialist, and now as a mathematics specialist. And I think I've got a great job. I get to watch teachers teach and create curriculum and, and uh, do a lot of uh, research and try to find best methods for teaching mathematics. Excellent. Well, so, so tell us a bit, because we School Improvement Network embarked upon a project with you mm -hmm. to document the work that you are doing in the state of Utah on math tasks. Right. So what is significant about a math task? I mean, math has been taught in schools for 120, I mean, well, well beyond even U.S. public education. Right. What's significant about math tasks? Yeah, one of the problems is that we've taught mathematics for 120, 150 years, and it's always been taught about, about the same way. Um, you know, we teach students an algorithm and expect them to memorize the algorithm and then just expect them to be able to compute results. And we think, and we've always thought the results were the important thing, the answer getting. Um, we've discovered that that really isn't enough. And it's kind of like the same argument between, in, in literacy, between whole language and phonics. That, that whole war of do we do explicit phonics or do we do whole language with literature, well, we finally discovered we needed them both. And so that's what we do. We do balanced literacy. Well, we've discovered that in the math wars that have been going on forever, there's been this big push of do we do discovery, um, inquiry type mathematics, do we do direct instruction in mathematics, and we've kind of gone back and forth where content is the king and then where the pedagogy is the king, and we finally decided we've just got to marry those two. So in Utah, we've come up with this concept. I don't know if it's unique to Utah, but we've come up with this concept of balanced mathematics. So a math task is the part of that balanced mathematics that gives the students an opportunity to, um, to explore, to, to uh, take, take something that is difficult to understand, that's perplexing for them, and to learn mathematics through their um, through their exploring of that particular topic. Um, and, and a really good math task requires students to really struggle with, mm -hmm. the, with the mathematics. Um, it requires them to go through a process and to find a strategy and, uh, and then to come up with a solution. And um, uh, so, it, so it's, it's, just a, it's just a marvelous thing, a really good, rich math task requires a lot of work, requires a lot of time. And so instead of assigning students 40 or 50 problems in a math class, we give them one math task that takes 40 or 50 minutes to complete. And they learn more mathematics in that one math task than they do doing 40 or 50 problems where they're doing basically the same thing. So this is different from, say, discovery math. I would say so, yeah. It's, it's different because because it's not the only thing that we do, and we also guide them very carefully. The first thing we start out with is what are the mathematics we want the students to learn from this task and from this series of tasks. We don't want them to just explore the mathematics and investigate over and over and over again. We want them to grasp, we want them to get the concept, to practice the concept, and then to solidify the concept. And so by the time we're done, we should be able to move into the algorithm, and then students should be able to use the algorithm with understanding. Mm -hmm. So we don't have anything against algorithms. Part of the problem with discovery math learning is that people said algorithms are bad, no algorithms, or don't memorize the math facts, and that kind of thing. Um, now, algorithms are there because they are, um, they are efficient. Mm -hmm. They've been proven over time to get the mathematics done, but our idea is that you have to have 
um, understanding of that algorithm before before you can really move on to the algorithm and use it flexibly and appropriately. Wow, so it's it's creating the hook. I mean, can you describe it in the sense that it's creating the hook for the student to learn formal mathematics mm -hmm. um, you know, versus what I experienced as a student was I'm always presented with the formal application of mathematics then told I need to learn it because right. I might have to use it sometime later in life. Right. We try to focus on um, what some people call real world mathematics um, and in fact it is real world mathematics. We try to focus on something that might be relevant to the students and it might not be quite relevant to to exactly where they are in their lives or exactly what they're doing. But um, but it is real world. Um, in fact, that's one thing that the Common Core tells us all the time. Um, use what you know about mathematics to, um, to, to, to solve this real world or mathematical problem. And, uh, and that's that's what we're trying to get them to do. That's great. Wow. So it's it's um what what excited us is as uh, the school improvement network crew was out in the schools. Um, you know, I, I remember the crews coming back and saying, "I've never seen collaboration in a math class quite like this." Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've never seen so many students discussing. There's, a, I mean, it's almost as though kids are working on social studies projects and and whatnot. I mean, is that is that accurate to a math task classroom? Oh, absolutely. We we expect students to to collaborate with each other, to talk about the mathematics, to learn from each other. Mm -hmm. In fact, we talk about uh, an instruction triangle. Um, and the instruction triangle is um, is teacher to student, um, student to teacher, and student to student. And we believe very strongly that that the most learning comes in this bottom part of this triangle, which is student to student. Mm -hmm. So it isn't so it isn't that students are sitting there and copying each other. They're discussing the mathematics. They're talking with each other. It's what some um, some people in the math world have called um, math talks and discourse, mathematical discourse. There you know there's plenty of research out there about that and. And so what we're trying to do is to get kids to talk with each other yeah. and, uh, uh, and learn the mathematics from each other. So it is, it's really, it's really a very collaborative process. Yeah. And we may start out after we've given the kids a task and say, think about this for five minutes, you know, mm -hmm. just take a couple of minutes to kind of grasp this in your own mind. And then we want you to move into groups and start, and start talking about it and try coming up with solutions, solution paths. Hmm. Strategies. So. Hmm. so solution paths where the teacher now sees the natural moments to step in and support the students rather than assign problems per se and what not up front. Exactly. So, wow. so what the teacher is doing is going around and looking at what students are doing and learning what kind of, of, uh, of questions they need to ask. So, that, so the, the, um, the whole job of the teacher becomes what kind of questions? What are, the, what are questions that are going to help the kids move forward mm -hmm. with their reasoning? If they're stuck, mm -hmm. what kind of questions can I ask them? Not what can I show them? Look at that. That's probably not right. You know, it's more like, where, where, do, what do, you, where do you think you're going wrong? Or think wrong. about this. Or, you know, just all kinds of really good questions. Wow. So, yeah. Well, I would love to be able to step in and see some of the other educators in Utah that you have worked with. And correct me if I'm wrong, but this has very much been an effort driven by the state office in Utah, correct? Yeah. yeah. Great. So yourself, your colleague Diana Sedworth, who we will also see on the video, will see a number of teachers on this video talking about the impact of math, of, of math tasks um, within their classrooms. So let's go ahead and watch that video. The video uh, for our participants is roughly six minutes long. The video may lag in the player for some of you, depending on your internet connection. So um, we'll give you about six and a half, seven minutes to watch this, and then we'll come back and we'll continue the discussion. And we'll also open it up for our participants to be able to ask you questions themselves about math tasks. So let's go ahead and watch the video. Sounds great. We 
have a lot of barriers in mathematics education. I think that one of our biggest ones that we need to overcome is a culture that accepts people not being mathematically proficient. Traditional K-12 through math education in the United States is failing to develop the necessary mathematical understanding and procedural skills in students. Overcoming this culture that says it's okay to not be good at math is one of our greatest barriers. In 2011, only 40% of U.S. 4th graders and 35% of 8th graders were proficient in mathematics. We've also created some of our own barriers because we have established another culture that says, if you don't get it, we'll just teach it to you again and again and again, and not necessarily in a different way. Here's the rule, memorize it. Invert and multiply, memorize it. There's some math programs out there that do absolutely nothing but procedural. And you know what, when they test those kids on, on a procedural test, those kids do wonderful. But if you take those children and try and put them on a real life world situation, they don't do so good. Then you come over here and you teach only discovery math. What happens to the children then? Accuracy goes out the window. We play through and understand everything, but we can't put it on a piece of paper. But, it's, but this has brought a whole different idea into what we do, and it's called a task. I have a garden at my house, and I have not started to plant it yet. After the playground had opened up, that like every third grader in the entire grade was out waiting to go on the slide. So Ivan's furnace, it's quit working during the coldest part of the year. So our math class today says, how many slices of pizza will we need for our party? A task-based approach to math education seeks to balance procedural fluency within a context of exploration and inquiry. Hey, Brooke, you have a question? How many students are in our class? Well, that's what you have to figure out. It presents students with authentic problems that may be solved using a variety of strategies and tools. You see it now? There you go. Well-designed, rigorous math tasks, coupled with relevant direct instruction, increase students' engagement level and cognitive struggle, leading them to a deep understanding of math concepts. 406, and then I got 522. Questions about that? Okay, I would say it's the most important thing we can teach our students to do is to think. They're not going to remember formulas. They're not going to remember procedures. But if you, we can give them that ability to take any problem, make sense of it, persevere with it, and think about it, they'll be able to solve anything. Which equals 15 miles. And, and you, did, you started with 30 on this one because? Because you go 30 miles. And if you square that, it's giving you 900. I know Ms. Segmiller has been stressing, like, why are you doing this? Why? Why? And I think we're just so used to, this is how you do it. And we're really good at getting a problem and doing it, just how the example shows in the book. But when you actually have, like, a situation, and it's like real life, you have to, like, use your brain and think for yourself. So now, what's your conclusion, Chelsea? My conclusion was the city car goes faster because you doubled the distance. Okay. Time. We're good? Okay. Thank you, Chelsea, very much. So the shift that has to happen in a classroom in order to have students really engage the way that we want them to is that the students have to do more of the math work. And then I used hands-on equations and found out what x was from the equations, which is 2, and then plugged 2 in to one of the sides and then got 70, so the coordinate where it crosses should be 278. It's not just that they know the algorithm and they've got it memorized. They know what that algorithm means and they know how to use it and they know how to be flexible with it. Okay. Why does she have two numbers here? Braxton? It's a coordinate pair. For Ivan's furnace, what does this mean? 270. After two hours, it costs $70. Educators who embed math tasks into their math instruction improve achievement for all students, enhance students' reasoning and problem-solving abilities, and better prepare them for college, career, and beyond.
Tell us what you're doing here. Making a five by array. A five by what? Five by five array. A five by five array. Why did you pick five as a divisor? Because our, my denominator told me that it was five and had to have five equal pieces. Perfect. We want them to understand that they can learn mathematics, that they can understand mathematics, that mathematics is important, that mathematics is relevant, that, that they don't have to feel stupid about mathematics, that they never have to say, I was never good at mathematics. When I think about what it is to have a great instruction in a secondary classroom, it really goes back to the teacher and what the teacher does. And so thinking about a teacher creating an environment where children feel safe, where they feel safe enough to engage in mathematics in ways that don't require that they immediately know a right answer or that they think, oh, I'm smart or I'm stupid, but really get in and grapple with the ideas of mathematics and thinking about how mathematics reveals the world in a way that no other subject area does. We have to add that because that's how it started out. Why are we multiplying by three? We multiply it by three because it, go, it grows three centimeters each year. Oh, perfect. Did everybody hear that? Yes. yes. All right, good job. Great. Um, well, David, uh, great video there. I mean, it's it's you, you, Diana, the others on the Utah team. You very much go through and and you set the stage for why math tasks are needed. Yeah. Uh, can you just reiterate that a bit for us? I mean, in this in this world of Common Core, twenty first century learning, uh, students coming up as digital natives, all of these things at play. Why is it that math tasks now matter? Well, I think they've mattered for a long time. But, but now, why they matter so much is because students really have to understand mathematics mm -hmm. in order to really function in today's world. Um, they, can't just, they can't just know how to do a few computations. Um, that's what calculators are for. You know, if, if, you, if you know how to do a few computations, all you can do is pull out your calculator and you've got it made. But if you really want to do something with mathematics, and this world requires us to do more with mathematics, just understand what's going on in the world, then you have to understand what's going on. You know, one of the, one of the things that we talk about, for example, is um, the algorithm for dividing fractions. Mm -hmm. you now, if you ask people what's the algorithm for dividing fractions, anybody can tell you. You know, you invert and multiply. And then when we say to people, why? Why do you do that? And, and how do you use that? And what's a practical application for that? Well, there are plenty of practical applications for it, but if you can't, if you don't understand why you're doing what you're doing, then you can't, you can't use it in a practical application. Wow. So, so, so almost in a sense, when I was in school, yes, I was dividing fractions. Mm -hmm. Had, you know, many lessons, hundreds of problems, all the rest. Right. Um, and I was actually quite good at it, and I'd score high on my test. But then when, let's say, I'm working on a recipe in my mom's kitchen, mm -hmm. I may not intuitively know, oh, that's actually what I need to do when, right. when I have to change the amount of ingredients I'm using this recipe. Right. I mean, is that, is that a relevant example? Sure. And if so, how would a teacher, using that cooking analogy, now utilize a math task? Well, they might say, um, you're cooking, you're baking cookies in your, in your grandma's kitchen. Mm -hmm. And it, te it calls for um, two cups of flour. You only have one cup of flour. Or you only have two thirds of a cup of flour. How are you going to make certain that all of the other ingredients are in the right proportions? Mm -hmm. How, what do you have to divide them by? So you have to divide all of your ingredients by two thirds. So you may have a half of a teaspoon of vanilla. Mm -hmm. Well, what's two thirds of a half of a teaspoon of vanilla? That's a division problem, and mm -hmm. so so you have to figure that out. Um, so so that's a practical application of division of fractions. Um, I think it's even more important though that the math tasks when we move through 
um, elementary school to junior high to high school. Why they're important for college and career readiness is because college professors expect their students to come in to college, not necessarily in the math classes, because a lot of college math classes are taught the same way that high school and, and other classes have traditionally been taught. But in engineering courses, in mm -hmm. um, other cour science courses where they expect application of mathematics, and the students don't have them, so then they have to go back and reteach mm -hmm. them and help them to understand. So, so anywhere where you've got an application of mathematics, the, the, the understanding is absolutely necessary. And, and even something as, as little as, um, oh, we're going through an election. Today, we're going through an election. Yeah. We see polls all over the place. We see graphs. We see charts. We see um, uh, margin of error. Well, do we really understand that? You know, what, what is all that about? Have we got enough statistical understanding to realize that when there's three points dividing candidates and the margin of error is five points that the poll is meaningless. Mm. You know, so 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 we have to uh, we have to know all of those things in order to really uh, that's modeling with mathematics. We have to know how to model. So it's almost applied mathematics in a sense. Oh, it is very much so. And and it's so traditionally we've looked at applied mathematics um, hitting high school students, hitting even vocational programs. Right. I mean, is can this sense of math tasks, looking at them applied, how early can that begin? Uh, kindergarten. We, we begin it in kindergarten. Um, because when we do that, then we have students who understand what they're doing. And then we start building. Because see, the Common Core is built on a progression. Mm -hmm. It's built on, if you understand something in first grade, then you're going to understand it, so a little bit more difficult topic, in second grade, and in mm -hmm. third grade, and in fourth grade. We followed a progression with this project that we did with you, Curtis, um, from kindergarten through 10th grade. And we started with addition and subtraction within five, and we ended with systems of equations using linear equations and quadratics. And, and it built beautifully to that, to that mm -hmm. concept. So if you're really going to have students understand the quadratics, yeah. You've got to start here with understanding of what they're doing. You can't you can't have them just going two plus three is five, and I know that, but do I know why? And do I know how that fits together? And do I know the difference between a number and a numeral? And do I know what the equal sign um, stands for? Because if I think that that means this is the answer over here, yeah. when I get to algebra and I've got two sides of an equation that I've got to balance, that equal sign doesn't mean the answer. It means they have the same value. Yeah. So, so all of those things are really important for kids to learn. So, so this is fascinating in the sense, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, in this scenario, students are learning the application of prior skills so that when they get up to quadratic equations, intuitively they're assuming this gets applied. This gets used in the real world because I've seen the buildup of this skill over time applied at every level, not just applied when I get to a complex, more rigorous learning event. Absolutely, absolutely. When you when you when you see um, at, not, oh, excuse me when we see multiplication or mathematics modeled at every grade level, when you have to solve problems at every grade level. And when you have to really understand what you're doing at every grade level, mm -hmm. then when you get to those really big applications, then you're used to doing that. And you look at it and you say, ah, you know, I've done this before, yeah. but I've done it in a lesser way. So if I'm doing, if I'm doing the linear and quadratics, well, in, in eighth grade, I may have done systems of equations with two linear with two linear equations, and in ninth grade, I may have done it with three linear equations, and and so you're you're building that up. Wow. You're scaffolding it from one to another, huh. and you're doing it in a way that makes it natural, that students get engaged in. I said, see, that's another thing about tasks that I haven't even talked about is the fact that tasks make mathematics relevant, they make mathematics fun, and they make mathematics engaging. 
So instead of students coming in and seeing this huge number of problems that they have to do and saying, oh, I'm not very good at math, they have the opportunity to show what they know about mathematics because they can apply it. Yeah. I've had teachers say to me, for example, that in the social part of this kind of, of doing tasks, that students who have traditionally struggled a bit with mm -hmm. mathematics, um, they'll get into a group with kids who are, you know, the, what, our, what our boss would call the speed boats, you know, the ones who are always moving forward very quickly. And the ones who are moving, moving forward very quickly, once they've got the task, they just want the formula, they want the algorithm, and they mm -hmm. want to get it solved and move on. Mm -hmm. And when you say to them, um, no, you've got to slow down a little bit, there isn't even a formula there for you to use. You've got to come up with that. Huh. You've got to figure out what these numbers mean. Well, then, the kids who have, who have always traditionally maybe struggled with math a little bit, yeah. they see things differently. They tend to see things holistically. They tend to see things maybe in pictures or maybe in, in, uh, uh, in, in, in a different way, organized a different way. And they can help these kids, the fast kids, the speedboats, to understand the mathematics, wow. which is really a cool thing. You kind of get this yeah. role reversal and you get these different um, perspectives and different skills melded together and it makes yeah. for a richer math experience for everyone. So this is pretty... It quite fundamentally shifts math instruction. It does. Um, you know, I, I, the, we have a number of questions which have been posed, and so I want to touch on these quickly, and I'm hoping that we'll have enough time to actually go into one of the classrooms and see one of these lessons All right. actually take place. So um, Naomi Young has a couple of questions. Let me throw them all out to you, okay. which is, are you relating this to problem-based learning? But then likewise, can you direct us to resources for good mathematical tasks that coincide with outcomes? Sure. Yeah, this is related very much to problem-based problem, problem -based learning. Um, in fact, in a, lot of, in a lot of places it's called open-ended problem solving. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Hung Si Wu, who is a professor of mathematics at Berkeley, well, actually he's a professor emeritus, has a really wonderful article about open-ended problem solving. And he talks about how you have to make sure that it fits together with the mathematics mm -hmm. later on. Um, but yeah, it's very much problem solving based. Um, based as well on seeing core mathematics. You know, when the, when the uh, people who wrote the Common Core put, put the Common Core together, they looked at all of these um, mathematical standards from all over the, all over the, the world and Singapore mathematics is very much problem-based. Mm -hmm. And so, boy, they brought that right in. Every, almost all of the Common Core is problem-based. Um, so, in finding resources, a lot of the resources come from outside the United States because mm -hmm. they've been doing it for much longer than we have. So you can find rich mathematical tasks on, um, from England. You can find them from New Zealand. Um, one really good source is a website that's called N Riches. It's spelled N R I C H S. Okay. Enriches.org, I think it is. Okay. And so that's a really good source for mathematical tasks. Another is the Mars Project. Uh, that's mostly secondary, but. Mm -hmm. But you can find some really, really good math tasks there. We've created a lot of math tasks in our state. Um, in our core academy, we had um, teachers write math tasks. Mm -hmm. And right now, we have um, almost 2,000 math tasks that we're in the process of culling wow. through and, and getting them ready to go on to um, Utah Educational Network, where they'll be available for anybody. Wow. And if somebody wants to mm -hmm. see those, they're on a wiki site, and um, you're welcome to send me an email, and Great. We'll, we'll get them, uh, we'll get them uh, with membership, and they can look at our tasks. Well, we're, we're actually, one of the things that we'll do is um, we'll, we'll send people these different resources who participate in the webinar, including the enriches, including access to the wiki through the Utah Education Network. The other thing that I wanted to make clear for the participants today, the video that you watched has just been released on PD360. So if you go, if you're a subscriber to PD360, go to pd360.com, click on the PD video tab, click on the on your license, 
And if you sort by new releases, the um, math task learning is the first program now listed uh, which features the video we saw with you today, plus goes into building a math task learning culture and also setting up a math task. So I just want to point all of our uh, viewers to that. A couple of questions which I think have real relevance here. Sure. Um, and one of them is by Bev Lawson. She asks, even if I have them do a task that integrates a particular skill, when another application is presented, the students don't know they had already done a similar task and can't move forward. They can understand weights with cars, but mention a boat and the knowledge isn't connected. Uh, okay. A a address this. Is sure. this a part of the implementation process? Students over time figure out, okay, I can transfer my knowledge in the application, no matter what the problem may be, or is this something teachers need to be consciously aware of? Teachers need to consciously build that into their programs. Because what, what we talk about is three different kinds of tasks. Mm -hmm. We talk about uh, introductory tasks, exploratory tasks, where the students are getting the concept, they're looking at the concept, and by the end of that concept, by the end of that particular task, they may have discovered some things about that particular mathematical mm -hmm. concept. If they don't get there, we do another exploration task. If they don't get there, we do another exploration task. And, and at some point, we may need to go to some interventions for kids. But then we move on to a practice task that has to do with the same concept. Mm -hmm. So, so we, we change the task. We tweak the task a little bit. So if we're talking about cars in one, we may move to boats in the next one, but we're connecting it. So it's the same type of task, it just creates a little bit different situation, mm -hmm. but now you're practicing the concept that you had before, that you've worked, worked with before. Then the last step of that is solidifying the concept. So at that point, what you're doing is you're saying, okay, we've learned the concept, we've practiced, um, different strategies of solving that. And now we're going to move on to solidifying it, which is where we're going to connect it to the algorithm. Mm -hmm. We're going to connect it to some real world, well, we've already been doing real world applications, but we're going to be able to connect that to other learnings that we've had. Yeah. So, so it, it's, it's not just, a, it's not just a, an exploration and then you end there and then you might throw in another task later on that has to do with the same concept. This is really a fully integrated unit. So, so um, one of the things that I want to point out is that this is an ongoing webinar series that we're doing. So as you speak to that specific how do you craft this task, I know one of the questions posed was can a middle school teacher use math tasks even if elementary students have not been exposed to it prior? There's a number of questions like that that we'll explore over the course of, of um, the next couple of weeks. And so I just wanted to point people towards the screen. We will be featuring Kalina Potts, who's a fourth grade classroom teacher on November 13th, and then Travis Lemon, who's an eighth grade teacher on November 27th. And so these are actual in the classroom math teachers. And we'll be exploring with them how do you actually create these tasks and implement it with the students. So I, I just wanted to point that out so that people know that we will be going much deeper into these questions that another, uh, in, in another webinar. But um, you know, there's, there's some other interesting questions that, that uh, the people have now. Um, and a couple, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to send to all the attendees today the, the websites that you've mentioned. Uh, real quickly, what's the professor's name at Berkeley that you had mentioned? Hong Si Wu. W-U. -W All you have to do is, is Google his name, just put in Professor Wu, mm -hmm. and he has a ton of articles. He's a great supporter of the Common Core. Um, he believes strongly in, in open-ended in, in, um, open problem solving as long as it's leading to mathematical understanding. Um, and his website is just a rich, um, a rich repository of thought about mathematics. Right. So it's good stuff. Well, so as we look at implementing in this, in this in the classroom, um, I have to bring up Myra Collins' question here because it's okay. very relevant right. to what teachers have been experiencing the past several years. And now we're saying, shift your instruction. Right. And so what Myra asks is, how long might a process like you are describing take, especially if students are experiencing difficulty, 
Teachers still feel so rushed and feel they need to move on whether students have it or not. Uh -huh. You think about pacing guides right. and all these other things which, which educators have become very effective at implementing over the past decade. Right. Now, how do we incorporate this shift towards math tasks within some of these challenges? Well, I've got the long answer and the short answer. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, basically the, the, the Common Core was built so that it doesn't have as many topics mm -hmm. that are covered in it. So, so th the idea of being rushed in mathematics, if you're still being rushed in mathematics and you're implementing the Common Core, you need to go take a look at the critical areas in the Common Core. You need to understand what is really necessary to be taught. All of the standards are necessary to be taught, and you need to take the time to teach them, but there are fewer and they're deeper and they're more focused. Mm -hmm. So that's the first part of that answer. Um, the second part of that answer is that at a certain point, you're going to have students who are going to need interventions. Mm -hmm. Now, that's something we're really used to doing in elementary schools in terms of um, tiered instruction, in terms of mm -hmm. tier, tier one instruction, which is what everybody gets, yeah. tier two instruction, which is um, yeah for students who don't quite get it, and tier three instruction for those who really, uh, who really struggle. So in our state, we've come up with a, a, a three-tier mathematics instruction model. Okay. And so what we say is that in your tier one instruction, about 80 to 85% of your students ought to get the topic. For those 15% who don't, then you need to um, go to a tier two intervention. And we've created some tier two interventions in our state, and there are some there are some uh, uh, some commercial tier two interventions as well, and you can find those. Um, and then, if the students who don't get it in tier two, you've got about two to five percent of your students, so maybe one student in your classroom who doesn't quite get that. So then they need some intensive intervention. Mm -hmm. And we always say that tier one intervention is for all students including the ones who need the other interventions, so those interventions have to be outside the class. So, so when it comes to pacing guides and things like that, we, we deal with pacing guides in our state as well as everywhere else. We chose not to make pacing guides from the state level hmm. because pacing guides in the past have been all about covering the content. Yeah. We don't want teachers covering the content. We want teachers having students understand the mathematics. Mm -hmm. So some units may take longer to cover. Mm -hmm. Some units may take shorter to cover. And we realize that there are teachers out there who are dealing with benchmark tests. They have to cover this amount. I think what needs to happen with that is there needs to be some work with district level leaders and other people who need to understand that assessments can only be effective if they work with the kind of instruction that's happening in the classroom. Mm. And if you focus on coverage, you can do benchmark testing at set times. But if you're focusing on learning, yeah. and you're focusing on, on students building that knowledge, then you've got to be more, a little more careful about how you approach those. Wow. So, so um, does this come from a focus on mastery? I mean, is, is it as yeah. simple as saying, the goal here is that students are mastering these skills and concepts versus being exposed to them. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, that's true. And, and, and I know that sounds almost simplistic in its analysis of it, but uh, for so long, I mean, I've, I've spent time with thousands of educators across the U.S., and without fail, educators state the belief that students really need to accomplish mastery. Right. But it's tended to be that we've implemented uh, requirements and processes and accountability and whatnot, which measures more the delivery of knowledge rather than the, than the application of learning. Right. So in the state of Utah, is it succeeding to get teachers to make this shift? Yes, it is. It is. We're seeing some really incredible things. Now, of course, with any kind of shift, it's like, it's like trying to turn an aircraft carrier. You know, yeah. you've got to do it a bit at a time. We wish it were more like a PT boat where we could just, you know, flip the thing around. But, yes. but yeah, we are making progress. We have our core academy where we have um, upwards of 5,000 teachers a summer hmm. who come and work with us on mathematics and English and, and science. Um, and, and we present this kind of 
this kind of, of mathematics. Um, but, you know, it is mastery. It is saying at this grade level, it, at this grade level, in order for you to, well, okay, let's just say in third grade, you have to have these skills before you can approach the third grade skills. Right. So, so yes, those skills below, the, below have to be mastered. And so when a teacher gets a third grader who doesn't have those skills, then they've got to do some work, right. some interventions to, to, to make certain that those come up to, come up to par. Now, one thing I really love, though, about the, core, about the Common Core is that um, it's built so that mastery can happen. You know, I don't think that there's, you know, and, and I'm talking about for all students. We have to do student-centered mathematics. I'm not talking about that just the mathematically inclined can master this. We, we have to believe. We Teachers have to believe. Administrators have to believe. Kids have to believe that every kid can learn this mathematics. Wow. I mean, we may have some kids who are very, very cognitive challenged who, may, who will have difficulty with it, but... But uh, we just have to believe that they can do it mm. and set high expectations for them. So one of our participants mentioned in here that this is similar to a conversation mm -hmm. that, that this, uh, excuse me, that this educator um, experienced uh, a person said 20 years ago. Right. Which I think speaks to, uh, there's been a recognized um, necessity for this very applied approach to mathematics. Right. Is it fair to say that the Common Core learning progressions provide uh, the standards, the learning pathway um, necessary to even look at pulling off something like a math task? Oh yeah, absolutely they do. And, and, and the math progressions that have been published by Bill McCallum and his group at the University of Arizona, they give you that, that whole idea of why you're doing what you're doing in first grade, moving on to second grade, moving on to third grade, fourth grade. And I think that's maybe what we've been missing in the past. Right. Is instead of having this very coherent progression, we've kind of has decided, well, we might, we'll do this here, we'll do this here, we'll do this here. And I think where we've missed the boat in the past is that we've swung that pendulum too far, mm -hmm. one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So we've swung it to the point of, of exploration just for the sake of exploration, thinking that all we have to do is teach kids how to problem solve yeah. and they're going to be fine. But they have to have the content. And then we swing it all the way to the other side where we say, well, content. And then we swing yeah. it back and forth. So now we hope we're in the middle where we can balance, um, where we can balance this whole thing. Yeah. We know we need the content. We know we need the inquiry. We're going to balance them in the middle and kids are going to learn mathematics hmm. and understand it. Wow. And it was Bill McCollum, correct, at the University of, of Arizona? Bill McCallum. Bill McCallum, excuse right. me. Yeah. He has, he has a website um, that he calls Common Core Tools. Okay. And, uh, and all you have to do is just Google Bill McCallum. And you can bring up his blog. And yeah. he has the progressions there. They're all in draft form right now. But wow. It's not just Bill who's working on that. Dr. Wu is working on it. Um, uh, there are Jason Zumba, Phil Darrow, other people who yeah. have been really involved in the development of the Common wow. Core. So one of the things that I want to share with our participants is we will follow up with an email where we mention some of these different experts who've been working on these learning progressions some of the websites. I want to point people back towards PD360, recognizing that today's webinar has been to introduce math tasks. Um, the following webinars, we will dive more deeply into what it looks like in the classroom. We will provide these other web sources. Um, one of the things, if, if you're open to this, I would love to be able to show one of these classrooms. Oh, sure. Because we've described this yeah, theoretically, we've described this in a big picture sense. What does it really look like when a teacher is actually applying one of these math tasks? So I'm going to go ahead and pull up um, one of these videos and just have to make sure that I'm, that uh, we're just pulling up the right video here. And um, so once again, we'll watch it. When we come back, we'll give you a moment to share some final thoughts with our viewers. But uh, go ahead and enjoy um, the video when it comes up here. All right. Okay, so 
everybody understand the question. So in other words, you want to do what in the race? Win. So which car do you want to have so that you will win? In this segment, Renee Segmiller, a math teacher from North Severe High School in Salina, Utah, guides her students to identify differences between the speeds of two race cars by setting up and solving a system of equations. Her lesson targets high school common core math standard algebra reasoning with equations and inequalities seven. Elements of related standards are also highlighted in this segment. If you would read about uh, the very first car. Okay, two very special cars have been developed. Steady car with the push of a button can instantly go from zero to one mile per minute and will continue to travel at constant speed of one mile per minute. And this, does the speed change at all? No, once you push a button, it stays constant. Okay, so Chelsea, would you please uh, read the, about the variable car? <clears throat> variable car. With the push of a button, travels a, a distance in miles that re equals the square of the number of minutes traveled divided by 60 until the button is pushed, releasing this feature at which point the car is controlled by the gas pedal as in a normal car. The task is basically uh, there's two special cars and uh, they have been devised so that one will travel at exactly uh, a mile a minute and the other one will travel at a special uh, formula, the, the time squared divided by 60 would determine how many miles it would go for each minute. Who would like to kind of paraphrase what's going on with that one? That one's a little harder. So how far it goes? You're going to square that and then divide by 60. Okay, so when you say how far it goes, it's not really how far it goes, it's how long it travels, how much time has passed, how many minutes has passed, you square that. The task is to decide if the, there was going to be a race between these two cars and it was 30 miles long, how, which car would you want to have so that you would win? And then the next question is if the track is 90 miles long. In secondary two, there's a common core standard for um, solving this system of equations uh, with a line and a quadratic, so it fits perfectly into that. The point of the whole thing is to get them to graph, to think about the systems, to do the two equations, do tables, and kind of see how to come to that solution of where the intersection of the, of the two different functions are. So if it was 36 minutes, you'd square root it? Not square root it, you would square, square. it. Remember the difference between a square root and a square? Okay, okay. what is the difference? What, how are square roots and squares related, guys? They're what to each other? Opposites. opposites, but what's a better word than opposites? Inverses of each other, they undo each other, very good. Thank you, Chelsea, for clarifying that. Anybody else have a question about the cars? All right. So what I want to do is put you in groups. So that's just going 60 miles per hour. Is that right? Yes. Okay. But this is 30 miles, and you're squaring the number of minutes. One mile. Okay. So then it doesn't say the minutes, so then that's our variable. And yes, you that's your variable. So you have it 60. Very good. Very good. The differentiation is, is probably in the groups. I've grouped them so that they get a little bit of help from each other so that nobody gets really stagnated or stopped. And from there, it's really just trying to get them to explain and listen and talk about what they're doing so that everybody kind of comes to the final conclusion. And so you want to take the variable car because it cuts it pretty much in half. Okay, now tell me how you got that answer. Uh, we took the square root of 180 because 60 times 30 is 180. And the square root. Mm, there's your problem right there. 60 times 30 is not 180. Okay, I want you to stop and go back and see if you can think of another way to prove this. Is there another way you could have worked this out and gotten those same like answers? Mm, think about some different ways to represent the problem. Uh, that comes back to the perseverance. If they're not willing to struggle a little bit to persevere, then they just kind of shut down and your task goes nowhere. So you have to have some sort of you know, question or comment or something to make sure that they keep moving. Okay, I need everybody to kind of stop for a minute. Let's kind of come together. I'm gonna to have Chelsea come up and show us what she decided. And so for the variable car, the equation we put was, sorry, you go 30 squared divided by 60. And that right there gives you 900. And you divide that by 60 which equals 15 miles. 
And, and you, did, you started with 30 on this one because? Because you go 30 miles. And if you square that, it would have given you 900. 30 represents the what? The distance. The distance. No, well, which 30 represents the distance? This is a little confusing. So um, on your very first one, Chelsea, right above the first 30, 1 times 30, would you put minutes right above that one so we don't get confused? Who can tell us why she picked 30 to put in that second equation? So the 30 minutes is comparing it to the top car's 30 minutes that it takes to finish the race. I try really hard to make sure they're they're being precise. I love mm -hmm. that standard in the in oh. the practice standards. Tend to a precision. I the practice standards are fantastic. If they both took 90 minutes to do the race, like over here, the standard car took 90 90 minutes. Then this one go 135 miles, so it'd beat it by a long ways. Okay, but we only had to go how far? To go 90 miles. So how do we know? for sure that at that 90 mile spot. But this one went farther in the same amount of time. It's there beforehand no matter what. Oh, it has to be because the it 90 miles time. is what the, the steady car did in 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. okay. Could we create a table? And I wanna create a table for, for the minutes traveled and then I want the distance for steady car and I want the distance for variable car. Okay. I think that's okay. So which one's not right? What do you guys, why do you guys think your problems or answers aren't right? Because it goes down to 41. Okay, I would have to agree. So how'd you do that one? 50 squared divided by 60. And now do 30. So now I'm starting to think our answers before weren't right. Yeah, Didn't side. somebody else get 15? You have to 30 on the first one. one on the front this is how I did it. So we should change 30 to, to 15. I don't think that's, yeah. that's not right. Oh, so. you know what? Oh, does anyone know? We were trying to get this. It's what, Lauren? It's that miles, was the mi 15 was the miles, not the minutes. Yeah, yeah so you yeah. have to plug it in for the minutes. So a 42.43 minutes would be where on our chart? Right there. 30 miles. Between the what? 40 and 50. Between the 40 and 50. Oh. So, so this one's wrong. So you were right on, Erica. So what is that telling you about, about the race, about the cars? Okay, say that again, Jaden. The longer the race is, the variable power gets faster every time. All right, so why is this one doing what it's doing and this one's doing what it's doing? What do you think? Spencer? It's because of the squared. Because of the squared. What does a squared do to a graph? It makes a parabola. And so what we can write is we can write one function is distance equals minutes. This is the steady car. Distance equals minutes squared over 60. There's our variable car. Those are two functions that we have going, okay? What do the graphs look like? Always make your graphs be workable for you. What we have here is we actually have a system of equations. We have two equations. We have a problem, we have a line. We have that system. And you guys solve the system. When we solve a system, where do you think the solution to that system is? When we solve a system, and for this particular problem, we're actually asking the question, at what point is the time for each car and the distance for each car the same? And where does that happen? 60, 60, 60. where else does it happen? Zero, zero, when they start out. It went well. I think the kids responded really well. I, uh, I sat down and immediately wrote some notes of how I'm going to change the task for next time because we really didn't get to solving a system. We only barely got started talking about that it was a system and where we're going from there. Because it's squared, okay? Alrighty. I see these students being much more prepared for college or a career. Their ability to think is going to improve their, uh, their success in wherever they are. I would say it's the most important thing we can teach our students to do is to think. They're not going to remember formulas. They're not going to remember procedures. But if you, we can give them that ability to take any problem, make sense of it, persevere with it, and 
think about it, they'll be able to solve anything. And that's what we want in the citizens of our country, and it's so worth it. So that's where we need to push. And there's going to be lots of mistakes along the way, but everything we do is a step forward, and it's going to be better. Well, um, David, I, I just in these last couple minutes, um, I, I just want to bring you back to the audience and um, share with us some of your thoughts around this, uh, some of the things you've talked about uh, with me personally in terms of class size, in terms of time, in terms of student engagement. Um, you know, and, and in addition, a question here from Bev Lawson. Uh, which asks, um, actually, why, why don't you address first your thoughts on the classroom, then I'll have you finish with Bev's question. Sure, sure. Um, I think that um, class size is definitely an issue. And boy, we recognize that, especially in Utah, where we have the largest class sizes in the country. But when you start doing mathematics in a different way, and when you're not trying to go around and touch every single student. But you have students working in groups, and those students are learning from each other, and it's student-based learning. Then our teachers are discovering that the class size isn't as big a deal as, as it could be. Now, it's mm. still a big deal. I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to say it's not. But, but, but doing math this way really creates a culture of learning within your classroom and uh, and kids learn from each other and it and it frees up the teacher to go around and to touch in different areas and to ask the right kind of questions and for example some of these classes that we were looking at um, Travis Lemon's class who was going to be one of your presenters he had 35 kids in his class and and all of those kids were learning and and they were doing very very well so, yeah, class size is an issue, but if you can do it right, um, perhaps you can deal with more students. And, and a key part of this, this is daily instruction, correct? Right. This is not one-off experience. This is not one per unit. This is everyday students engaging in math tasks like this, correct? Well, for a lot of teachers, yeah. For the teachers who really do this very, very well, it's what they do every single day. For other teachers who are just getting into it, I would never go to a brand new teacher or to a second year teacher right. and say, you've got to do math tasks every day because it would blow their minds. So what we say to them is, do a math task a week. Do a math task a month. Collaborate with your fellow, with your teammates and figure out how to, how to write those tasks together and then utilize those resources the way that, the way that, uh, um, you, know, the way that you want to. Yeah. So, so, but for some teachers, for the ones who really do well with it, it is every day they do that. Hmm. And so, what they've done is they is they've um, dealt with the issue of time because they don't have to. They they've taken tasks and they've replaced forty or fifty problems on a sheet with one task, wow. which creates a lot more time in the classroom. Hmm. Um, they've dealt with class size because they have students working in groups. So they can actually handle more students, and some of wow. them are even are even are, they're very very good at that. One of the classes that we watched, like I said, had had 35 students. Another one had 30. Um, this one that we watched in Carrie Siegmiller's class, not not Carrie Renee Siegmiller's class, um, that was a smaller class, um, but you know it works. It works yeah. in any size of those classes. And what about assessment? Assessment becomes a really really big issue because the Common Core does constitute a real departure from the way that we've looked at things before. So a multiple choice test in terms of the Common Core is going to be problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, but we found a couple of things in our state. We've had school districts who implemented the Common Core clear back in 2011. It came out in 2010. Mm -hmm. They started implementing in 2011. And they were still using our CRT, our, our Criterion Reference Test, which is completely um, multiple choice, and their scores went up. Wow. Because what they found is that when students understand the mathematics, they're more able to deal with the skills. Yeah. 
mm. because the skills become just right. second nature to them. Now that doesn't mean that assessments don't have to change, and I know that there are many people who are working on that. The question that you were referencing says, what if your standard test we use is the ACT? Well, since this is a curriculum, this math curriculum and the English language arts curriculum is being taught throughout the United States, even the ACT folks have recognized that they've got to get on board and they've got to wow. change the way they do things. So you'll see that kind of thing start to happen over the course of time. Yeah. And, and in the meantime, I wouldn't worry too much about it because I think that when kids are taught this way and learn this way, then the skill-based things are not that big a deal. To them. Wow. Well, um, I, I, you know, unfortunately, <coughs> excuse me, unfortunately we're out of time. Um, I really want to thank you, David. I would invite our participants to please write in. Thank David for the incredible work that yourself and others at the Utah State Office are doing. Um, I, I want to highlight uh, the, the additional webinars that will happen around math tasks. Once again, specific to uh, fourth grade teacher Kalina Potts on November 13th, Tuesday, November 13th. And our webinar series always happens at, um, at 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Central, noon Mountain, 11 a.m. Pacific. So that's a consistent time on all these webinars. And then, of course, November 27th, uh, featuring Travis Lemon, um, eighth grade teacher. And Travis is one who you've talked about as well during this webinar. Um, likewise, for those who would like to attend, we'd like to invite you to the Thoughtful Approach to Classroom Observations, which will be conducted by Dr. Harvey Silver um, uh, on Wednesday, November 7th. Uh, another very rich um, webinar around um, conducting observations which are helping teachers identify their practices in the classroom rather than purely um, you know, uh, simplifying it in kind of a gotcha type evaluation. These are about observations to really drive practice. So a um, number of people saying thank you. David, do you want to uh, say something final to our audience here? Certainly. Well, thank you. Thanks, everybody. It's uh, always a pleasure to talk about mathematics. I have a job where I get to work with math every single day, and I love it. So thank you for for being here and for listening in and uh, keep working hard. You folks are amazing, you math teachers and supervisors. Keep up the good work. Thank you. And uh, just going to change the screen here just to end. Um, we have a number of polls here. We would deeply appreciate your participation, um, identifying what you would like to learn more, what topics you would like us to address in these webinar series and any feedback you may provide for us. Um, like I said before, we will send you an email um, listing the different resources we discussed today. And uh, please go on to PD360 and watch that Math Task program. Get into those classrooms. It's a very, <coughs> excuse me, very powerful approach. So David, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Appreciate it, Curtis. Thank you.